Today's scripture reading is Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are fear, furious, I'm sorry, ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cast down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you, you will recognize them. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Please keep your Bibles <coughs> excuse me, open to Matthew 7 this morning. I did want to... Just send some batteries here and I'll use this mic until... I, I know, but it's going to die again. We'll see. Either that or, or something on my body hit it. Hey, I just want to say, say a couple things. Um, one, about Memorial Day. So tomorrow is Memorial Day. I just want to encourage you uh, to, at some point in your day, uh, go to... One, two. Yeah, thanks, Trey. That was fast. <laughs> okay. So I just want to encourage you at some point, if your town has, a, like we do here in San Dimas, uh, has a, a war memorial or memorial wall, uh, that you just go there at some point during your day. You don't have to stay the whole day there, but I just want to encourage that. Uh, or, or some other, maybe there's a national cemetery, if you're watching online, near where you live. And um, if there's some veterans there, shake their hands and, and thank them for their service. But I, I really want to encourage you to also read a few names off the wall or list the names of those who, uh, who died in service to our, our country and just you know, pray for their, their families. You won't, may not know who they are. Uh, you may find someone you recognize and just remember to pray for them. And it's a, a way for us. Yes, it's a wonderful to have the day off and it's wonderful to have that good food. <laughs> Uh, but I think it makes that food even better and that time even better when we, we pause and remember um, what these, did for us, these folks have done for us. Secondly, I want to remind you, and I hope this slide will come up. It's called uh, You Asked For It. I don't know if you, you guys got it. I sent it in a little bit late to our, our tech team. So, okay. Well, anyways, you saw it in the email yesterday, and I will send it also out as an email tomorrow. We're going to start a new series called You Asked For It. And that series means you get input on what uh, is going to be preached. We want to know, uh, I want to know what it, questions you have or what topics you would like to hear preached on uh, uh, for, for the summer. I want to start this on June the 20th, so it's up to you. If I get no responses, I'm not going to preach at all. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> then, then I get to decide it, decide it all. So uh, you should have seen a link in the email that went out yesterday. I'll send another email uh, t tomorrow or, or, or Tuesday uh, as well. Uh, you can fill out a welcome card if you're here in the, in the sanctuary and put it in the box. I'd like to hear a sermon about this or have a question about this. If you're watching us online, you can, you can message us on Facebook. Uh, hopefully you can find that link in the, in the email or you can go to our website and, and, and fill out a, a card there too. But I want to hear from you because the series is called You Ask For It. So you need to ask for it. Here we are. We have well, one week left in this series from the Sermon on, on the Mount. And today we are in Matthew 7, and thank you, Debbie, for reading verses 15 through 20. So I want to start simply by saying this. Are you ready? Beware of the boogeyman. Beware of the boogeyman. Now, I did spell it correctly. I thought it was with two O's. How many things boogeyman is with two? I thought it was with two O's, but evidently... The boogeyman can't even spell his own name right. It's just spelled with, with one O. Do you remember checking under your bed 
checking the closet because the boogeyman was going to get you. Did you remember that? I don't know where he was going to was going to do with us, where he was going to take us. Um, it didn't matter. I just didn't want him, want him there. But then you eventually grew up. And you got older and you realized that's a silly belief and you stopped believing in the boogeyman, which is a good thing to do because there is no such thing as the boogeyman. But then we read Matthew 7 and Jesus is telling us, in a sense, watch out for boogie people in the church. <laughs> Like, Jesus, you can almost hear the disciples arguing, Jesus, this is the church. It's your church. Everybody follows you. Everybody loves you. Everybody's nice to each other. Certainly you don't mean there are going to be bad people. Jesus doesn't call them boogie men. He calls them false prophets. Certainly, Jesus, there's not going to be bad people in the church. And Jesus kind of doubles down like he usually does. When he's talking to the disciples, he says, yeah, watch out. They do exist. Not only do they exist, but they get in close to you. Not only do they get in close to you, they disguise themselves so they're hard to to recognize. Difficult to identify, but Jesus says, I'll teach you how. And a question we have to begin with, with this morning is this. Are we willing to learn how to identify false prophets. Are we willing to learn how to identify them? And the first thing we have to do if we say, yes, I want to learn how to identify false prophets is to admit that they exist. It requires here that we believe Jesus, that there are those in the church pretending to be his followers who have the potential to influence us and diminish our love and devotion to Jesus. We need to admit that even we can be fooled. And there are those in the church near us, and even in our lives, in our spheres of influence, who we think, hey, this is a good Christian, this is a good person, but they have influence over us to diminish our faith, our devotion, our love to Jesus. So we need to begin by admitting they, they exist. Now, sometimes we have hard, a hard time believing that people can do bad things. I remember when I was, was a young kid in school, and they had what we called crossing guards. Who remembers crossing guards? Not adult crossing guards, not people that they hire as adults to go out there and cross. Kids being crossing guards. Did you have that in your... No, it's, it's kind of rare today. I mean, they literally gave... I was a fifth grader, folks. Me and one other fifth grader, we were responsible to walk out into the street with our cool yellow vests, and our big signs that said they had the stop sign on top, and we would stop traffic. There were no adult supervisors around. I know it sounds odd. But we did have an adult um, that, who administrated this, one of the teachers. I still remember his name, Mr. Seeley, because he told us. He trained us, and we got training on how to do it right. And he said, now, there may be cars that don't stop. And we're like, Mr. Seeley, don't you see the cool vest? Don't you see the big sign that says stop on the top? The cars are going to stop. And he'd say, no, now listen, this is how you do it. You don't walk all the way to the middle of the street. You walk partway to the middle. Then you hold your sign in the middle and you watch the car. And you make sure it does stop or the cars do stop. And then you wave those who are crossing it. But just in case it doesn't stop, you need to be ready. And he had this in this, you know, kind of this stance. You had to be ready to take your sign and get back to the side of the road. Now, I went out there, all right, learned, got the training. I did not believe him, did not believe there wouldn't be a, be a car that wouldn't stop. And it was probably the second day doing it that me and my friend were out there in this car, and we go out and blow the whistle and hold up this cool sign and stand there all proud, and we're watching him. We look at each other, and this guy's not stopping. <laughs> he wasn't speeding up, thankfully. He wasn't aiming at us. He was just showing us. He wasn't stopping, and, and we took our signs and ran back to the side, and, and he, he went on. Of course, we report, we're not smart enough to get license plates, and we're just fifth graders, so we'd reported it. And he was a high schooler. We were right next to a high schooler, which is why they told us, there are going to be kids who don't stop because they were high schoolers. That's what happened. But they existed. And the truth, is, it, it, Jesus is telling us here, listen, there are false prophets. But not in your church, Jesus. Yes, they sneak into the church, and you need to be able to identify them. There are those that we like, People even that we admire, who pretend to have our best interest in mind, but who lead us away from loving Jesus with our whole heart, mind, strength, and soul. So would you join me in prayer? Gracious, almighty God in heaven, 
Give us ears to hear, minds to understand, hearts to receive and obey what the Holy Spirit is saying to us this morning through your word. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's begin with this question. What is a false prophet? Prophet. It's someone who we think of as a good Christian or even a good person who appears to be a follower of Jesus, but in reality, they're following their own will. It's someone who appears to be a follower of Jesus. They have all the trappings. They do all the things that a Christian would do, but they're not truly surrendered in their will to Jesus. They're not following his will. If you were to, uh, if you get, you have your Bibles open and and we're in verses uh, 15 through 20 of Matthew 7. If you were to look back where we were just two weeks ago in verses 13 and 14, uh, we, we heard Jesus taught us about the, the narrow path, which is to life, and the wide road, which leads to destruction. So we would say this about the false prophet. They look like they're on the narrow path, but actually they're on the wide road to destruction. And if we're not careful, they can lead us down that same road. You notice here it says they're disguised in sheep's clothing, meaning they could be someone near. They could be a a friend. They could be someone you admire, a a mentor, a a teacher, a, 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 a television or sports personality, someone you look up to. Someone whose life, because they're, they, they're successful, someone whose life you want to, to imitate. And you think it's good to imitate them because you think they're a follower of Christ, but they're not truly following Jesus. And because we don't look closely at their faith, at their, at their character, at their fruit, we can get fooled by them. It may help here if we do this, if we replace, the, to understand what a false prophet is, replace the term prophet with what a prophet does, which teaches the Word of God. And so instead of false prophet, we could say this, that what they're doing. It's the false Word of God. Now, it helps, too, to understand when we talk about prophets, sometimes we think of people, you know, amazing people who are predicting the future and telling us what's happening in the future. The majority of prophecy in the Bible isn't telling people what's going to happen. The majority of prophecy in the Bible is simply explaining God's Word, bringing correction to people, helping people to understand this is what God wants you to do. And last week we were talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit from Acts chapter 2, and it, and it said that we would prophecy. Those who put Jesus, who trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and are filled with the Holy Spirit, says your sons and your daughters will prophesy, meaning that we will speak the word of God. That's what prophecy is. So a false prophet is someone who is pretending to speak the word of God, but they're speaking, here it is, the false word of God. Does that make sense? Sometimes in our mind we think they're, they're telling lies about the future, and, and that, that could be There is some prophecy that's future prophecy. The majority is simply explaining, helping us to understand, pointing us to, correcting us so that we may understand the Word of God. So let me just give you some examples from Scripture. So a true prophet would say that Jesus is the only way to salvation. So Acts 14, there's no other, other name under heaven by which we may be saved, only through Christ. A false prophet would agree, yes, Jesus can save you, but also there's other ways to get to heaven. There's other ways to be saved. Jesus is a great way. They may even say, Jesus is the best way, but not the only way. You hear hear how my voice goes down a little bit, kind of uh, to be subtle. That's what a false prophet would teach. Uh, A true prophet would say this. Jesus would agree with Jesus' teaching. If you love me, you obey my commands. That if you love Jesus, you will obey all his commands. That's from John 14. But a false prophet would say, yeah, it's important to obey Jesus' commands as as best you can, the ones you can, most of them. Do your best. There's always grace. There's always grace. God will forgive you. God will forgive you. Of course, God forgives. But he expects, he demands us to uh, obey all of Christ's commands. So you see how the false prophet kind of subtly says, well, a few of them aren't that important. One more, one more example. 
A true prophet does this, speaks words of correction. That's not right. That's not good. That's harmful. A true prophet says the, that horrible, bad word, no. <laughs> Whereas a false prophet speaks words of permission. True prophet, words of correction. A false prophet speaks words of permission. That's okay. That's no big deal. If it makes you happy, then go for it. Mm -hmm. Which is not the word of God. So that is what is a false prophet. Let's ask this next question. Who is a false prophet? So look around each other. No, don't do that. <clears throat> I think the, the answer, though, to this question is, is a key in helping us uh, identify. What, what we need are these, these discernment antenna, if you will, right? Um, uh, some means by which we are constantly aware and being careful of who we allow to influence us. Because if their influence is leading us away from Christ, if someone close to us whose influence diminishes our love and devotion to Jesus, then they are a false prophet. And they might not be a horrible false prophet. It may be they're, they're, they're just uninformed. And, uh, but they are being like a false prophet to us if over time their influence, we find, is diminishing our devotion uh, to Jesus that's what a false prophet does. This is their effect. Our reverence for Jesus' commands, our reverence for the Word of God begins to diminish. We go from worshiping, as they do in Revelation, holy, holy, holy Lord, to holy, holy Lord, to holy Lord, to good Lord, to I like Jesus. We just kind of drop one holy at a time. It's subtle, and, and this is where we almost have to be ruthless in our, in our discernment. Is this person, uh, either someone near me or someone far away that I admire, someone books I read, someone who I allow to speak into my life, is this person causing me to revere Jesus, to love Jesus more, or do I find that the holiness of God is diminishing in my, my mind? When our love and devotion to Jesus become less, then the means of grace that God has given to us have a lower priority in our lives. When our love and devotion to Jesus begins to diminish, then the means of grace have a lower priority and sometimes are even annoyances in our life. Now, means of grace are simply are those means, those ways, those conduits, those practices that God has given to us by which we can experience His grace. We can grow in the knowledge of Jesus. We can, we can have God's presence with us. So coming together in worship is a means of grace. Reading God's Word is a means of grace. Prayer is a means of grace. Gathering together with other Christians in a small group to encourage each other in our faith is a means of grace. Communion, of course, is a means of grace. And when other things take priority over those things, it's a sign that the reverence for God is diminishing in our life. We don't need Him as much. We don't, if we don't need Him as much and don't want Him as much, why would we pursue Him through the means of grace He's given to us? And therefore, a false prophet, if a false prophet is leading us that way, we can begin to recognize them. <clears throat> we tend to think the false prophet is easily recognizable, right? Some famous personality. In fact, when we say false prophet, and it happens to me, and maybe it happens to you too, uh, I, I think of those TV evangelists. Some of you don't even remember their names anymore. You're too young. Of those TV evangelists who were caught and, and embarrassed and, and defrocked, or, or maybe modern-day pastors who got caught doing something bad and were fired from their job. We think of these famous people. But Jesus, I believe here, once uh, says something important. He says it in verse 16, and, and again, if I, if I have it right, uh, in verse 20 in my notes, yes. He says, you will recognize them. You will know them. Someone whose voice is recognizable. This word recognized was used in, in Acts 2 when, when Peter was in prison, and he got out of prison by the angel, and he was knocking on a door, and they weren't letting him in because they were praying for him to get released from prison, and they couldn't believe he was him. There's a young girl named Rhoda, and, and, and she wouldn't open the door. Who is it? And he it said, it's Peter. And it says she recognized his voice. She knew his voice because it was someone 
near her. A false prophet is someone whose voice we will recognize, someone near. We, it's not going to necessarily be someone famous, someone big, someone out there, but it's someone close. Think about this example. When we talk about the Antichrist, we always think of the Antichrist as being some great world leader. Do you know that the term Antichrist is not found in the book of Revelation? I know. What? What do they do? <laughs> Mind blown. It's found in the, uh, the letter of 1 John. I believe it's there four times. And in fact, in 1 John chapter 2, uh, John writes that the Antichrist, in fact, he writes, many, many, as in plural, Antichrists have gone out from among us, from the church. They're looking for the, I don't have to worry about the Antichrist, some world, crazy world leader. I don't have to worry about false prophets, some crazy, you know, famous leader. No. They're near us. This is why Jesus gives us this warning here. Someone close, recognizable, who has influence, a friend, I'm saying these again, but I think it's helpful, an author, a teacher, a TV series, a computer game, a group of friends, a mentor, a relative, maybe someone famous whom you admire. It's, always, it's almost always someone we admire and we have a personal connection with. They slowly drain our will, our love, our devotion to Jesus. So the word of God sounds no more important than other words of wisdom in our world. And because they are disguised, because they're not easy to recognize, Jesus gives us here a guide to recognize false prophets. We, we could call this um, uh, false prophets for dummies, right? How to recognize false prophets for dummies. And just for a little bit of humor, I, here's an example. If you had to have a book that said deep sea fishing for dummies and you open it up, it would say yes to this. What is that? Anybody know? Some of you know that. That's a tuna, right? And then you turn the page, this is no. That's a shark. So if you're going deep sea fishing, yes on the tuna, no on the great white shark. Stay away. That's what Jesus gives us here. Um, how do we identify false prophets? And I'm just going to point out three things. One is this. Their gifting is greater than their character. Their gifting is greater than their character. They have great gifts. Very uh, often they're successful in life. That's part of what attracts us to them. They, they are living the life we want to live, and they're professing to be a Christian, so we think that the life they're living is a good Christian life. And it may look like that on the outside, but the, the heart of that life, particularly if they're successful financially, is all about getting more money, not about getting more Jesus. Their talent, gifting, charisma, personality draw us, and we like them and admire them. And we assume this, if God has blessed them, Right? If God has blessed them and He's given them these gifts, He must be endorsing their behavior. And this is where we need a, a mind change. Gifts, the gifting of God is not the same as character, our character. God entrusts gifts to us. In fact, the Bible says, I think it's in Hebrews, that the gifts are irrevocable. These are things that God gives to us, and He wants us to use them for His kingdom, but people often choose to use them for other things. Again, I, may this be a, a mind-blowing moment to us, but there are those who have incredible gifts, even gifts of the, of the kingdom. And we'll see this more next week, but if you were going to go, go on and, and just read in the next, next few verses, you will see there are those who had gifts to cast out demons and do miracles, but they were not following the will of Christ. Their character and gifting are two different things. You can have great gifts and a horrible character. You can show great, um, um, impressive deeds in your life. And people will think, man, that person's a great Christian, but that doesn't mean so. You may remember years ago, um, there was a, a, a well-known basketball player. He's still well-known. He's a, actually a great commentator. His name's uh, Charles Barkley. And he was in a little bit of a, a kerfuffle. Is that a word? Because um, he wasn't living the way his fans wanted him to live, or the majority of fans. And they said, you're to be a role model. And he said this. You remember the line? I am not a role model. And I think he was right. I think he was correct in saying that. People disagreed with him. 
but you're famous. And I think there's a sense he's saying, yeah, I may be famous. That doesn't mean you have to admire me and, 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 and do what I do. And that's what Jesus is teaching us here. Just because someone is, is great or big, even in the church, doesn't mean that their character matches up and we should just simply blindly or blindly follow them. The fruit of someone's character can be found in Galatians chapter 5, uh, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit, many of you know this, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So we want, oh, we, we want this. When the Holy Spirit comes into my life, then I become successful. Then I become famous. Or then things go well for me. And Jesus says, no, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, then you grow in love for God and for others. And you grow in peace and patience and kindness and joy. It was a a pastor named Timothy Keller who said this, the product of a true, growing, gospel-centered nature is often gentleness. That stuck with me. Seeing someone grow in gentleness is a sign we're looking for that that's a true follower of Christ. Okay, secondly, false prophets diminish the faith of others and cost spiritual lives. They diminish the faith of others and cost spiritual lives. Uh, Jesus calls them here ravenous wolves. Uh, Later on in Acts, I think it's Paul, will call them savage wolves. A ravenous wolf wants only one thing. What does it want? To eat. (laughs) To eat you. In other words, it doesn't have any concern for your well-being. It doesn't want to promote you, to help you, to see you succeed, to see you grow at all. The false prophets just, prophet just wants you for themselves. You are a pawn to get the thing that they want in life. And by the way, let's just pause here for a moment and do a check in our own hearts. Because as we're, we're listening to this, we're going, hey, there are times I can tend to be like a false prophet. I don't care about that person. I only care about what that person can do for me so I can get this job done or I can get ahead or I can get something else. They're stepping stones. And that's the, that's the heart of a false prophet. They don't care about people. They just, uh, except for they want people to help them get what they want. They are ravenous wolves. If there is an influencer in your life who is not pushing you closer to Jesus, but you find their influence causes you to withdraw from him, Beware. Beware. If you have an influence in your li- influencer in your life and they are always giving you permission, telling you what you want to hear so you can succeed in the goals you have for life and they're not giving you correction and pointing you to what Jesus says, what the Word of God says, then we need to beware perhaps even run away. If the more their influence over your life grows, then the less you find yourself seeking Jesus, honoring the Sabbath, reading God's Word, then you should run away. Some of you have heard the term marry up. You know what that means? Mark's over there, oh yeah, oh yeah, my wife, no, you married up, Mark, (laughs) not Crystal. (laughs) To, To marry up, means that you find someone who loves Jesus more than you and will pull you up to love Jesus more. That's what it means. We tend to want to find someone who will just give us permission to live as we are, not correct us, not try to change us. Do you know the problem with marrying up? I married up, by the way, is you have to cause your spouse to marry down. Have you ever thought about that? (laughs) But if I marry up because their faith is greater than mine, I'm pulling them down. <laughs> don't, don't think about it too hard. It hurts your brain. But, but this is what a false prophet would do. And, and think of it in terms of friendship. We should friendship up. Those people we choose to, to be our closest friends, and I'm not saying we dismiss all those who don't follow Christ, but those we allow to be our closest friends, those we, those we tag along with and hang out with and are, and are most influ- influential in our lives. If you have not friendshiped up, they will pull you down. Because that's what false prophets do. They diminish the faith of others. And this is a big one to just 
add this to it because we can go, well, it diminished my faith a little bit. No, the result is of diminished faith, meaning faith, faith continues to diminish. The hole is not plugged. It continues to leak out until our, our faith is dead. They cost us spiritual lives. And finally, uh, I think this is an important one too. False prophets, how do you recognize them? They don't recognize Jesus as judge. My, my um, software didn't want, allow me to capitalize judge there, but I did on purpose because Jesus is not just a judge. He is the judge. The Bible says that we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And by the way, this is another way we know that Jesus is God. Because, wait a minute, I thought God was the judge. Yes, Jesus is judge. I mean, that's how, one of the ways the Bible helps us understand that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, is fully God because he takes the place of of God and he does the judge, he judges. We will all stand, not some of us, we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So the false prophet would say, oh, Jesus is a great teacher. They understand that part of his identity. But they leave out the identity of him being a judge who will judge all the deeds of our life. And if they don't leave it out, then somehow they give themselves a pass. Well, I'll get by, or, or I won't have to be judged. No, our lives will be judged. Jesus will judge us by the fruit as we've been allowing his truth and his word to penetrate our hearts and transform us, make us holy, make us like him. 2 Corinthians 5.10, For all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due do us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. False prophets easily get into our lives. Sometimes we invite them because we like them. This is a hard part, huh, when you like them. And I'm not saying we, we have to, to hate them or, or, or cast them into, you know, never talk to them again, but we do have to draw a line and not allow them to be so close to us that they pull us away from Jesus. In my life, it was most recognizable for, for false prophets, I remember as a younger person, were those who had lots of things to do late Saturday night and always wanted to do something on Sundays. <laughs> and what did their influence do? It drew me away from church. Or if I still made it to church, I was very, very sleepy when I was there. Some of you are going, I know that, Pastor. I know that right now. I see you nodding off right there. (laughs) And so I had to withdraw. I had to withdraw from those friendships, and that wasn't easy. That wasn't wasn't fun. It wasn't that I didn't like them anymore, but they were drawing me away from hearing the Word of God and gathering together in worship. Identify those whose influence in your life are like a false prophet. and Be aware. And run away. And just so you know, God supplied in my life <laughs> men of faith. Um, uh, Curtis G., Dennis Peterson, names none of you know. Lisa knows those names. <laughs> uh, who were there on Sunday morning. We weren't keeping me up late on sat- Saturday nights. And were there on Sunday mornings worshiping together. And their, their lives influenced me because they were true prophets of God. And he'll do the same for you. So we close with this thought. When our love and devotion to Jesus becomes stagnant or become stagnant or begin to fade, it is often because we're under the influence of a false prophet. When our love or devotion to Jesus begin, becomes stagnant or begins to fade, it's often because we're under the influence of some false prophet, some false teaching. Be aware of that and, and cut it off. Would you stand with me as we, as we pray? Gracious Almighty God, we thank you for your word to us today. It's an uncomfortable word, Lord Jesus, which is one way we know it is the truth that you have given to us. Because we want to say, no, no, Jesus, it's in your church there's never going to be someone who would pull me away from you. And you say, beware of false prophets. So we ask, God, that, that you would allow your, your word to us to, to become true in our lives. As you said to us today, you will know them by their fruits. You will be able to recognize them. 
So as, as we have uh, discussed and learned and, and understand, Lord, that uh, they have influence and power, give us this discernment. Give us this ability. You said we can have it. You'll say we'll know it. To discern when, when people in our lives whom we've allowed to influence us are close to us. Whether it's a, a real person, whether it's someone who's, who's reading we, books we like to read or movies we like to watch or, or a, a other, an other influencer. Let us recognize them. Show it to us, Lord. Even right now, as your Holy Spirit is speaking to us, you're not saying everything's okay, but Lord, you may be saying to us, this is dangerous. You need to change this behavior. You need to seek my power to, to stop this. We receive that from you right now, Holy Spirit. We recognize these things are slowly moving us away from saying, holy, 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 Lord, to you are a God I like. So give us this discernment and give us the strength to withdraw from, to remove ourselves from the influence of false prophets in our lives. That we may grow in our love, in our devotion, in our commitment to you, Jesus. In your precious name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.